Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. In the early 2000s, John Lefebvre co-founded Neteller, an online payment company that was listed on the London Stock Exchange with a market capitalization of over $2 billion. Natella ran into legal troubles in 2007 and John lost close to $500 million earned from the company, went to jail, and had to restart his life again in his mid-50s. John is currently a writer and climate change activist. He has written two books, All's Well, Where Thou Art Earth and Why, and Good With Money, A Rich Guy's Guide to Gaining Everything by Losing It All. He is also the co-founder of the dsmogblog.com group of blogs which focus on exposing misinformation about global warming. Our interview will begin right after messages from our sponsors. Have you been wanting to launch your podcast and just haven't found the right resources? I launched Master Leadership Podcast in 2016 and it now ranks in top 1% globally. I've gathered all I've learned and created Master Your Podcast in a Weekend course on Master Your Swag app so that you have everything you need to share your voice with the world, minus those excuses. So download Master Your Swag app on Google or Apple platforms to access the Master Your Podcast course and launch your podcast this weekend. Welcome, John Lefebvre. How are you? Don't get old, Lily. I've had a little trouble with my technology this morning, but I think we've captured it now. Pretty strange for a guy who's 70 years old. I don't act like I'm 70. I tell people I can still do 40 in the dark. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so are you ready to pour into our listeners? Uh, yes, yes, of course. All right. So, John, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. I've been a lawyer. Um, I was raised a good Catholic boy, an altar boy, and a choir boy, and those sorts of things. Um, I've repented myself of being a Catholic and a lawyer, uh, but um, I've learned very, very good lessons from both of those disciplines, shall I say. I prize them both, but I participate in neither <laughs> any longer. I was raised by a single mom. My dad died when I was about three years old, and she had three kids, five, three, and one. And uh, we were raised in Calgary, Alberta. We're on the eastern slopes of the Rockies, and it's very easy to skip school in the morning and get on top of a mountain and ski. That's the sort of culture Calgary has, which was very lovely. And I was very, very fortunate. Although um, when my dad died, my mom got a $92 a month pension, and uh, that was in 1955 when $92 meant something. <laughs> but... Um, and I practiced law for about 15 years, uh, reasonably successfully, but not very rewardingly for me and my soul. I moved on to um, different things, including unskilled labor all the way through to sales and stuff. And I decided eventually to go to law school. Uh, and an entrepreneurial opportunity came up for me in uh, around uh, 1999 or so. A client of mine, Steve Lawrence, was paying attention to this new thing out there called the Internet. And um, he realized that people were gambling on the internet and that he figured out that, you know, if somebody brought some responsibility, reliability, professionalism, security to the online money transfer side of online gaming, that that might be a good little business model. The long and the short of it is we started a company called NetTeller in 2000. And in 2003, we went public with this company. It was pretty much like PayPal, except devoted primarily to online gambling. In those days, that was mostly sports betting. Since then, poker has become very, very huge. We did that, and in 2004 or five, we went public on the London Stock Exchange, and we uh, attracted a market capital of over two billion American dollars. And I owned 27% of that at the time. So when I was a kid, you know, I was always quite irresponsible about balancing my checkbook and whatnot. And so I was the guy least likely to wind up where I wound up. 
you know, be careful what you wish for. But I finally wound up in a position where I didn't have to balance my checkbook anymore. It didn't matter. There was so much money, it didn't. So I think all of us in North America are extremely privileged. Even the people who are not doing well in North America are relatively extremely privileged compared to some people in what we used to call the third world. People, you know, starving on the deserts of Somalia who, you know, naked, dusty breasts yield nothing but dying whimpers from their flea-bitten kid, you know. Um, that's kind of a long story, and we'll get back to how I feel about those sorts of things. But, you know, we are extremely privileged in North America, and I count myself among the most privileged of the most privileged. Being a wealthy man has um, left me pretty thoughtful about what it's like for everybody else on the planet who doesn't enjoy the uh, treasures that have befallen us. By dumb luck, mostly. But anyways, we went public and I did very, very well. And then in around 2006, I think it was, uh, Uncle Sam put up his hand and he arrested us all. And uh, we were- wow. um, pivotal moment. Talk to us. We were threatened with three very serious charges, uh, money laundering, conspiracy, and uh, racketeering. The press release from the Department of Justice uh, said what we were doing was uh, white collar crime on a monumental level, on an unprecedented level. Wow. Uh, when we were arrested, Lily, we were about halfway through a fiscal year and we were on track to transfer $14 billion that year, mostly between American gamblers and offshore gambling sites. And we were making about three to 6% of that money as it slid through our hands. It was an astonishing thing. In those days, there were lots of internet companies that were doing unbelievably well on the stock market, astonishingly well, considering that none of them could prove any revenue streams yet. Oh, and um, NetTeller was a company that could prove up vast revenue streams. And so people got very excited about, it. you know, it's internet plus they got money. <laughs> so oh, oh. it really, really went crazy. And then, you know, about four years after that, uh, we were all arrested and the corporation was arrested. It wound up that, you know, I paid a $40 million forfeiture. My partner paid a $60 million forfeiture and the company paid a $140 million forfeiture. So we wound up forfeiting about a quarter of a billion dollars to Uncle Sam. That was at a time when U.S. was spending about $2 billion a week in Iraq. Uh, and so I calculated that, you know, our quarter of a billion dollars would have got them through to about coffee time Monday morning. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> so it was a very interesting experience. You know, I'm grateful to have had it. It was a, a fascinating experience. And it left me in a situation where I don't have to work anymore, really, you know, uh, but um, I, I do do quite a bit of things, but I don't need the money from them. So um, I'm, I'm once again, extremely fortunate. There's so much to unpack here. I'm not sure if we're able to do it today, but that was an incredibly pivotal moment in your life. Did you lose everything? Did you have to start from scratch? Like how did... No, no. I lost uh, maybe $300 million worth of paper value. But we uh, negotiated a plea settlement for about eight months. And uh, when we did, I pled guilty to a much lesser offense. It was a five-year maximum offense, conspiracy to promote illegal gambling. And I paid the forfeitures that we spoke of. But I wound up with about that much money, again, in net worth uh, left over. But one of the things that made me more notorious even, I think, than that was what I did with that money. When we went to court in New York in uh, 2011 for sentencing, my lawyer was able to represent to his honor that I had given away about $50 million at that time to various charities and other sort of social development initiatives. And there's probably about 15 million more dollars that I gave away that's un, sort of unreportable. You know, you give money to people who just need it. I was clearing through my boxes recently and I, there was um, a couple of boxes of mortgages and there was about 75 of them and about half of them were marked forgiven. <laughs> You know, young single moms and other people who were in trouble and couldn't really get any help from a bank got some from me. And um, most of that happened before I was arrested. Um, from the money that was left after I was arrested and I lost all that net worth. All of my uh, business advisors told me was ridiculously ignorant about giving money away because I kept on doing it. They wrote another book about me. It's called uh, Good With Money, A Rich Man's Guide to Gaining Everything by Losing It All. <laughs> and it's called Good With Money because all of my financial advisors told the person who wrote the biography that I was not good with money. <laughs> and so the book is kind of interesting, but besides being kind of an interesting story, it's about what does it mean to be good with money? In my book, making more of it is not 
what being good with money is about. That I would say that's sort of the trade of money. The art of money is to actually change things. And we'll get into that a little bit more later too, because it's a fascinating part. But Well, well let's talk a little bit about this. You talked about the fact that you were an attorney. Yeah, at that time, it wasn't speaking to your soul. You said something about soul work. Yes. So yes, I yes. know that there's a that pivotal moment where you started to tap into your soul work, which is what you're doing now. So tell us a bit about that. There was a pivotal moment in my life about my soul, but it happened a lot before I got rich. <laughs> and I was fortunate that I came into that kind of wealth when I was, I'm not going to say mature, but I was quite old. <laughs> you know, I was in my mid 50s. When I got into this business, I imagined that I might get my net worth back up to about zero. <laughs> and I got obviously well beyond that. But I knew from the beginning that what I wanted to do with that was be demonstrative about what I thought the responsibilities of wealth were. And I kind of lived that out and I, I, I did as much as what I could and I, I did a lot more than I should have. And when I say that, I mean not in terms of how much I blew, but in not being particularly careful about who I helped. And I helped some people who straight up probably didn't deserve it as much. And I wish I hadn't because I wished I had that money left over to help people who actually do need it more. So, you know, being a philanthropist requires a certain amount of wisdom, you know, when you've only got three or four hundred million dollars to give away. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know what that looks like, but I'm certain that it would go to good use. So you also spoke about your book. Tell us about your books. I know that now you're a writer, you're a climate change activist. I mean, there's so much going on, John. Tell us about that. Well, my Good With Money, a Rich Guy's Guide to Gaining Everything by Losing It All was written by Kerry Gold. I had started writing a kind of a biography at one time, but I tired very quickly of writing sentences that start with I and end with me. Yeah. And decided I, I, if you know, if I was only going to write one book in my life, it should be about something more important than that. And so I did, and I left that aside. And eventually I got Carrie to help me with that book because it also seems a little bit self-important to me, at the time anyways. It may turn out that eventually an autobiography would be a worthy work for me. And I'm getting closer to that now. But the long and the short of it is I changed horses midstream and began to write a book that's more about our human species, where we are in time and in space. In other words, where we are in eternity and infinity, how much we know and how much we don't know yet. It starts off with um, some um, kind of thought experiments about, you know, um, how many other thoughtful species there are like us in the universe. And I calculate that there are around a minimum of 10 trillion of us in the universe. And then we think that they don't exist. And our best argument for their non-existence is that we haven't heard from them as if anybody had the capability of speaking to us for some reason they would not bother and then i began to think about that it's an interesting thought experiment for me in this respect i think about how much we've learned in the last hundred years you know since my mom was born when my mom was born in you know the 20s we didn't really even know what germs were we only barely knew that and in the hundred years now i don't even have to say any more than that to say imagine what we've learned right. but now our learning is becoming much more rapid and a much higher quality Imagine what we're going to learn in the next hundred years compared to what we did in the last hundred years. And that's really astonishing. I mean, for me, that was really mind blowing to think of if we learn a thousand times more, what does that mean? And then I thought, well, what about 200 years or what about 500 years? If there are 10 trillion species in the universe, we're thoughtful species. I'm going to say some of them have to be a million years old mm. or a hundred million years old. Where does that kind of learning bring us? And so what I came to was, if we were wise, we would be humble, but I think we're neither. <laughs> and I want to say something about that, because I learned that there's a strong connection between humility and wisdom, like you can't separate those. You can't grow in your wisdom if you're not growing in your humility. And this brings me back to your book, right? All's Well, Where Thou Art Earth and Why. Tell me yes. about your book and where can I get this book? You can get it at Amazon and all of the other things online. You can get it at Audio. Audible? Yeah, Audible. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, if you go to johnlefave.com, you can buy the book there. But you can also listen to the audio book for free on johnlefave.com. L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E. -E -E. Of course, I was going to spell it like that. Yeah, that's just the normal way, right? <laughs> JohnLefave.com has all those things on it, including all the music I've ever recorded in my life, too. 
Wow. You are like, you know, that commercial, the most interesting man in the world. I, just, do. <laughs> I, I, I sincerely <laughs> doubt it, but I'll take somewhat interesting. <laughs> So this podcast is about leadership and our responsibility here. I mean, you're certainly expanding the awareness in yourself and in others. So what's our responsibility as leaders? What most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? The thing that concerns me the most, Lily, is um, when I hear people dissing government to young people. Mm. When people say things like government, they can't do a damn thing right. They get everything wrong. They're a bunch of crooks. They steal all our money from us. They get your nose out of my business and your hand out of my pocket and, you know, smaller government and lower taxes. But to me, smaller government and lower taxes are dog whistles for no regulation. And I don't want to share. What I think we should be doing is understanding that constitutional democracy has created for us and put in our hands the strongest tools ever invented by our species to control selfish wealthy. And those tools are the top powers to tax and the powers to regulate. And we're very, very close in America for those tools coming back into the hands of people who aren't beholden to the selfish wealthy. And so I'm very optimistic that sometime in the next 10 years or so, the far right in America will lose its disproportionate grip on democratic power in America and the majority once again will rule. And I think what will happen when that happens is the wealthy will be taxed properly. Everybody will be provided with their basic fundamental rights. My thesis is that I speak to equality. I'm more of a Declaration of Independence guy than I am a Constitution guy. I think you know that the Declaration of Independence is primarily about rights and the uh, Constitution is primarily about freedom. I start with rights, but it's not necessarily equality of everything. But I think there is an equality of our rights at the very fundamental level. I think many of the things that we take for granted in our Western society are really just the fruits of freedom, the benefits of freedom. But we do take them for granted. We feel entitled to them. And, you know, Lily, actually, I think that's okay. I think we are entitled to them in a certain way. So let me tell you what those things are, I think. Respect and security, integrity of the person, you know, of ourselves, right? Reasonable access to food, clothing, and shelter. Reasonable access to the tools of self-improvement, education. Reasonable access to health care. Reasonable access to finance, basic finance, banking, you know, credit cards, those sorts of things. And reasonable access to justice. You know, we have the police we can phone when we've got a problem. We have lawyers that we can phone when we've got a civil problem. And last but not least, reasonable access to a healthy environment. So I'm not thinking about equality in the sense of income or, you know, material advantage or, you know, those sorts of things, but those basic rights. Now, back to what we were talking about, I think with a 2% wealth tax in America, and I think as soon as America does that, it'll happen around the whole world. (laughs) <laughs> because, right. you know, as soon as America figures out that that's really good to tax revenue, all the American rich guys are going to try to go to France. And guess what France is going to do? <laughs> They're going to say, actually, that's the Trey Smart. <laughs> and I think what we should do with that money, I think Elizabeth Warren calculated that if 2% on everything over $100 million annually would give about $2 trillion over 10 years. And that would be enough money to give child care, health care, education, elder care, a basic annual income. I know this sounds kind of pinko to Americans, but before we're finished here, I'm going to be able to make the case, I think, that giving this money away isn't going to cost any money because it's going to make everybody more affluent and all of the rich guys, the Bezoses and that, will have a lot more well-heeled customers that can buy runners from them and all the rest of that stuff. So I think that we're just so near now to creating a society in North America, at least, where the responsibilities of wealth will include paying their fair share to get along. I'm going to make one more point here before, because I know that there will be people putting up their hands and saying, no, no, that's not fair. I worked hard for my money and they taxed it for me when I taxed my income and now you're going to tax it again. The selfish wealthy want us to understand that as if it's a gospel truth. But the selfish wealthy in North America have a system that you and I, working guys, pay for. We only tax income in America, not wealth. 
Well, selfish wealthy want us to think that that's right. That's the way things should be. But what that amounts to is working people support a system that makes the selfish wealthy absolutely secure in their ownership of that money. Interesting. If they own that money in Russia, they have no security. Putin could take it any day. If they own that money in China, same thing, right? right? But in the Western nations and constitutional democracies, the taxpayers are providing a system that make the selfish wealthy's ownership of money absolutely secure. They're getting it for free mm. and they should pay for that. And it should cost them at least 2% a year. Here's another thing that's kind of mind boggling for me. If a guy like Jeff Bezos paid 2% a year for all of the money over a hundred million dollars, he would never even know he paid it because his wealth is going up 80 billion a year. The same with Elon Musk. It's just vastly exploding. And they're whining about, oh no, if you keep charge me 2%, I'm gonna move to Switzerland. I don't think they will. I don't think they'd even know they were paying it. And here's the beautiful part of it. If everybody in America had a guaranteed income, security, persons had help with their childcare so that they could go to work all day and not be babysitters, the productivity in our societies would just explode. I've talked about this with some pretty right wing guys, you know, libertarians about wealth. You know, in my mind, I imagine that wealth is actually kind of infinite because if you think that in the world now about 20% of us have our own human resource properly developed, if we developed the other 80%, then there would be five times more affluent people in the world to be customers for those guys. Anyways, I think we're on the very cusp of people understanding these things that I'm speaking about. And what they come down to that I think is very fascinating is that we have three things going on in our world right now that are forcing us to do something that's epochal in terms of change of our consciousness about being a species. And that is that we've got a contagion, right? And we've got climate. And this international now is quite ubiquitous distrust of government authority, right? And those crises are forcing us to understand that we on earth are a single community. That's right. Right. And if we have these rights, we're lucky. We could have been born in Somalia, but we weren't. We were born here. So if we're entitled to these things, why aren't the people in Somalia? And you go say, well, I can't help it if I'm lucky. That doesn't satisfy me. <laughs> I think if we're entitled to those things, everybody on the planet is. And what I see is in about two generations is understanding our responsibility, the responsibilities of freedom and the responsibilities of freedom, I think, are to strive every day in any way that we can, as big or small as is available to us, strive every day in every way we can to assure that everybody else on earth is on track to have the same things that we think we're entitled to. John, I love this kind of conversation because it just elevates me as well. And so I'm hoping that it lands on the ears of people who need to be vibrating higher. But it is our responsibility as leaders to continue that to continue in humility, to walk forward as we continue to learn from each other and have great conversations like this. You spoke about global warming, but you're also the co-founder of a blog that speaks to this. So tell us about that, where we can connect with that. In about 2004 or five, my friend and colleague, Jim Hogan said to me, what you heard about these blogs? I said, I've heard of blogs. I don't know what the heck they do though. I and mean, what do you do? You write about things that interest you and then people like pay attention. How does that happen? <laughs> and he said, I think we should do a blog about climate environment. Jim is a highly regarded PR professional in Western Canada in Vancouver. And he was also the chairman of the David Suzuki Foundation Board of Directors. David Suzuki is a preeminent ecologist here in Canada. Um, people all over the world know him. For some reason, Americans don't know him as well, but he's a buddy of Ray Hansen and you know Gore and all of those. They all know who he is. And now I'm on the business and finance and the investment committees of the David Suzuki Foundation. And I'm a founding director of the David Suzuki Institute. So those are sort of my designations with respect to those things. Desmog blog, we started it in about 2005. And in 2011 or 12, a Time Magazine said we were one of the most important 10 blogs in America. And the slug line of Desmog blog is clearing up the PR pollution that clouds climate science. 
Mm. And so Jim's a PR professional and it was a wonderful time for us because these scientists were saying to us, our life has changed utterly since you guys started to do this work. How's that? Well, we all spent half of our careers or more debating science with climate science deniers. And what Jim and I taught those guys was climate science deniers don't do any science. They do no science at all. The only thing they do is raise doubt. And if they can raise doubt about the climate science, that's sufficient to keep our you know, governmental authorities, our regulators from not taking the steps that would be detrimental to, for instance, the coal industry. And so the uh, fossil fuel industry guys became very avid about the misinformation about climate science, because as long as they could maintain a level of plausible doubt, that gave our government authorities all the excuse they needed to do SFA about it. Do people in America know what SFA means? I don't know. Can you tell us? <laughs> the first word is sweet and the last word is all. So sweet F all. And that's more or less what our government authorities have done. So anyways, the smog blog came along and we convinced scientists and everybody else never talk to a climate science denier about science because they don't care about it. All they care about is getting attention and raising doubt about climate science. Yeah. The only thing you should ever talk to a climate science denier about is where they got their money. And when you talk to them about where they got their money, they shut up. They say, well, that's private. Mm. We went off on a journey of investigation and found wonderful things about how much money Exxon has spent on people who've made a career of shooting off their face about climate science denial and that. And they've spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Exxon hasn't heard the last of this. I think they're on the carpet now. They're being investigated for all of I think what they've done with those, they've committed a fraud. One of the most harrowing things for me about America. And I'm a Canadian and I love America. I've only recently got my permission to travel to America again since I was arrested for this gambling offense. But I think I would make a good member of the American community, if not a citizen, because they need to hear the things I've got to say. Dsmogblog.com. Right? Yes, dsmogblog.com. There's uh, dsmog.uk, dsmog.gr, Germany now, uh, dsmog.au in Australia. And in Canada, the, the blog is called, has changed it from desmog.ca to narwhal. Do you know the narwhal? It's the yeah, animal with yeah, the, it's kind yeah. of like this unicorn of the sea. Yes. yes. And, and uh, narwhal gets wonderful awards every year now for journalistic professionalism and accomplishment in that. So, so that was pretty effective. We pretty much changed the conversation on climate science denial. They're not denying climate science much anymore. They're just making other kinds of bullshit excuses. For <laughs> All right. Important information, check out dsmogblog.com and get more information there. You expose misinformation. One of the things you can do on dsmogblog is if you're getting information that looks like it's kind of anti-climate science or a bit pro-fossil fuel industry and claiming that we shouldn't be regulating it any more than we are or less or, you know, whatever. What you can do is you can look up that person on dsmogblog and dsmogblog will tell you who's paying them their money. Oh, interesting. Important information. Appreciate that. All right. So let's change this a little bit. I had a guest, uh, Dr. William A. Adams was on and he asks an important question. He talks a lot about diversity and inclusion. So his question to us is, how do you maximize inclusion in your organization? Right. That's a very important thing to do. Well, I have to say, I really don't have an organization anymore. But when we had NetTeller, we utterly disregarded race, gender, and all of those things. Not only that, we utterly disregarded appearance. And it was actually a very good strategy in 2000. Let me tell you what I mean by that. There was all these young people who were very, very smart, but completely disaffected with society in, in those times, and probably for good reason. They'd have tattoos, and they played with hacky sacks, and they wore shorts, and they didn't wear shirts and ties. A bunch of misfits, but man, they worked all day long and all night long, and they were just so joyful and grateful for an opportunity to really go at something big. And it was extremely successful. We were probably on the vanguard a little bit where somebody in the head office would yell, hacky. All of a sudden, 15 people would be coming around and doing hacky sack in the middle of the office. For it. But we realized that if that's the atmosphere you had around the office, you didn't get much out of them for those 15 minutes, but you got just superb stuff for the rest of the eight hours that day. And so we created an atmosphere that was maybe a little bit more human and respectful and grateful for people's devoting the miracle of their human consciousness 
to our <laughs> business. We found that if we treated our employees like that, they worked for us like it was their own. I think that's the thread that we've been talking about throughout this whole conversation is adding value to others as leaders. So it's really important, I think, to understand that outsiders have extremely valuable perspectives about what it means to be in our society, right? And in 2000, just about everybody except white males were outsiders. We're kind of excluded and I'm going to say disrespected preference was paid. So much of the trouble that we're having in America now is just, you know, white guys losing their grip on advantage and acting like juveniles about it. It's time to grow up. When people get the same rights that white males in America get, that's not white males losing their rights. That's just everybody else getting the same rights. I really love using the pronouns. I walked into the Mountain Equipment Co-op store here and I wanted to get some tools, implements for sports for my four-year-old granddaughter at the time. And I walked in and said, well, we've got a, a new grandchild and I want to you know, get whatever there is that can help introduce sports. And the person said, without a blink of an eye, he said, how old are they? And that was so cool to me to hear somebody respond in that non-gender way without even batting an eyelash. I decided, you know what? There's no point in being a Jordan Peterson about that. There's no point in pretending that it's foolish to care about pronouns. It's a lovely way to show understanding and compassion. And it speaks volumes. Again, it's about adding value to those around us and always up-leveling that because we never arrive. So there's lots to learn, right? Now, as a listener of this podcast, John, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? Well, I would ask people, why don't they encourage young people to pay taxes, to pay their fair share? Why don't they encourage young people to regulate, to protect the environment? One of the things that I'm very excited about is that the young folks are becoming aware of that and they're doing it on their own. And I'd hope if they need a little bit of encouragement, they could go to johnlefave.com. <laughs> I really do want to encourage young people to look forward to taking the lead. The, the levers of power are going to come to them. You know, one of the things that happens in America and in Canada too, is whenever we have an election, the 35% or so that support the selfish wealthy or drink at their trough always show up to vote. The variation in conservative voting in both of our nations is, does not fluctuate very much. The only thing that fluctuates is how many of the rest are gonna show up and vote. I'm really disappointed when young people say things like, oh, I don't do politics or, you know, I'd rather go mountain biking because that's exactly what the selfish wealthy want to hear. That's music to their ears because they always show up. And the reason they always show up is because they know what's at stake. Right. And what's at stake is the levers of powers to tax and regulate. And we can work just on the very, very cusp of being able to take that back in our societies. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we close out? I would like to say a few things about this. Why do I think we're all the same in the world? <laughs> okay. It's actually quite miraculous that this thing that has befallen us, you know, you and I, and you know, the starving lady on Somalia with her dying baby, we are all at our very essence, the same thing. And what do I think that is? Well, I think we are the universe's vessels of consciousness. We all have exactly the same capacity to dream and the same capacity to be disappointed. That's right. And that's what makes us the same. I think that, you know, we should understand that that lady needs our help and that we have some responsibility to bring her some help. I think that people have an obligation to those who are less free and they have an entitlement from those that are more free. Responsibility, yep. And this goes over the whole world. America's really good at libertarianism. It's a little bit behind on responsibilitarianism, <laughs> <laughs> right? Now we're all the same because we have this miracle. What are we? We're the universe's vessels of consciousness. Think of this, Lily. If it weren't for species like ours, the universe would be astonishingly, infinitely fascinating place, a mind-blowingly astonishing place, but for nobody. We are how the universe looks at itself and marvels at itself. And if it wasn't for us, it would be this huge, vastly mind-blowing place, almost utterly unappreciated. People say, what's our purpose as a human being? I say, well, first of all, it's whatever purpose we adopt. But if there is a core purpose 
for us. Our core purpose is we are the universe's vessels of a consciousness. That means we're the universe's vessels of astonishment and of compassion and love. And so we are here to help. Some people think that, you know, all the animals are the same. Well, we are sort of all the same, except for one thing. When we get a broken leg, an orca can't fix it. But when an orca gets a broken fin, we can fix it. We can ruin things and we do, but we have this other magical thing and that is the ability to help. And I think it's a supreme failure when we neglect our ability to do that. So how do you make this consciousness thing real for yourself? I like to remind people that part of us that dreams at night, that's almost infinitely creative and imaginative and poetic and detailed and all those things. That part of us that dreams at night does not go to sleep when we wake up. It's there all day. And what I think we should try to do is just for a moment each day, sit and be quiet and treat all of these ideas that come into our minds and distract us for a half an hour each day, just treat all of those things and their responsibilities. So they're important things to think about, but there's not one of them that can't wait half an hour. So what I would encourage people to do is just for half an hour, practice skilled management of attention and don't pay any attention to these thoughts that just drift into our minds about our responsibilities and our distractions and all the things that we have to do. I think what we need to do is let that part of us that dreams at night, let it be in the daytime. And every time we do that, the things that rise up within us, there's always a solution to a problem, an encouragement to be more compassionate, you know, all of these sorts of things. So be still, yet still be just for a while. And every time you do that, a miracle will happen. And when you do that, you'll start to think about these things like the magic that it is that we are what we are and how we should use that for all life in the universe right. and i'm with you it's, it's an amazing way to tap into the power that we really have as humans and the great responsibility that we have as leaders so i want to thank you so much john for adding value to me and to our listeners it's been a great conversation we had a, a famous zen teacher came here and spoke to us one day and the very first thing he said is the most important thing we can pay now is attention. And I want to tell you that I'm very, very grateful for the attention that you've paid me today. Thank you. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.